Wisdom Through Action is a contemporary, sea-influenced school teaching the work of personal inner development in the system brought to the Western world by G. I. Gurdjieff and P. D. Ospensky. Mr. Ospensky said, The most important ideas and principles of this system do not belong to me. This is chiefly what makes them valuable, because if they belonged to me, they would be like all other theories invented by ordinary minds. What he meant was that this system comes from higher mind, from conscious influence. It is an objective system to bring a man to awakening. Welcome to Wisdom Through Action. My name is Kay Smith and I will be hosting the show along with Cal Gorham. Throughout our shows we will be discussing the work of inner development that we teach in the tradition of G.I. Gurdjieff and P.D. Ospensky. So Cal, will you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in these ideas? Sure, Kay. My first introduction to the work of Gurdjieff and Ospensky was when I was quite young. Uh, growing up in Wisconsin, my father had very many books and some of these books were by Gurdjieff, Ospensky, and other authors. And I, I read some of them when I was a young teenager and didn't have a lot out of them. Um, but the ideas, the seeds of the ideas were in my mind. But it wasn't until a few years later when I was in college and decided to take a winter off and go backpacking around Europe mm -hmm. uh, that I, I actually began to realize the value of these ideas. And the story from, from that when I was uh, towards the end of my trip, as various things happen, when, when you travel, I was broke and, and uh, alone and had ended up in a cave on the south coast of Crete, wow. which uh, in the winter is not a, not a terribly nice place to be. And uh, no place to go and a few books. And so I spent several days out at the, the front of this cave overlooking the Mediterranean and reading a book by a student of Gurdjieff's uh, called Towards Awakening. And, and I realized that it is quite easy to fall down in this life, to go down to a place where there's not much possibility of pulling yourself up again. And this was one of the ideas that, that Gurdjieff taught and his students taught. And being there in that situation myself, quite ill, quite cold and tired, and no place to go except down, mm -hmm. that it, it, I realized the value of these ideas. And so when I came back to the States, uh, I was lucky enough within a year or two to come into contact with a school and start studying these ideas and learning how to incorporate them into my life. Excellent. Yes, it's, it's quite, a, quite a story. Um, well, in today's shows, we will be discussing the role of esoteric schools and different paths to enlightenment or self-consciousness as well as touching upon the general obstacles to, that keep us, keep us asleep. In early July, I was a guest, on, a guest speaker on Beyond the Matrix, also aired here on SBN, in which I had the opportunity to speak at length about G.I. Gurdjieff and his search for meaning. Um, and he had, a, he had a particularly burning question that he, he sought answers to at, at quite, a, quite a young age. And the question was, what exactly was the purpose of life on Earth, and that in particular of mankind? So after years and years of searching uh, throughout uh, the, the Middle East and um, the Near East and Northern Africa, Russia, all of those countries, Gurdjieff was actually discovered by a secret brotherhood. Sometimes, um, well, it was a secret brotherhood or it was a school, and he was actually taken by this brotherhood um, blindfolded and um, put on put on a, put on horseback up into the um, mountains somewhere in in the in the Middle East area to a hidden monastery in the Hindu Kush, and there he endured intensive, specially arranged conditions and teaching that is sometimes referred to as esoteric Christianity, and it's it, he's it's designed to awaken conscience and to teach a person how to develop a conscious soul. And know that you have studied quite a bit about this, so could you talk a little bit about um, esoteric schools in general and some of these brotherhoods or societies that have, ex have existed? Sure. 
Throughout history, recorded history, there, there have been teachers, uh, <clears throat> men and women, who pass on exact knowledge about the nature of humanity, about the nature of individual men and women, and about the nature of the universe, and they pass this knowledge on to future generations. These teachings have taken many different forms. They've been expressed in many different languages, but the inner core, the inner truth, is, is always the same. So fragments of this teaching can be found in Sumerian hieroglyphics, cuneiform tablets, on tiles and stones dating back eight or 10,000 years to the, the beginning of recorded history. Mm -hmm. And even farther than that, these ideas are, are older than recorded history. They go back to a time which we know maybe from myths or legends. And some of the, the symbols from this ancient teaching are even used today. The symbols that we use for the sun and the moon and the earth and the elements. These are maybe seen as, as fragments of this older form of teaching. Mm -hmm. And that was something that Gurdjieff had talked about um, in his travels, that the, the ideas were, were quite quite ancient. Quite ancient, yes. And, and always the same, but the form is different. So some of these teachers uh, left historical records. We know about them from the historical records. So Zarathustra, quite ancient from, from uh, the, the eastern areas. Moses, Pythagoras from Greece, uh, Lao Tse from China, Jesus, Rumi, oh, many, many teachers whom we know about and many more that we have never heard of uh, because the, the legacy that they left was not in a form that we recognize or the students did not write down their names. Mm -hmm. And so the work of these teachers is carried on by their students and their students may continue for many generations in secret, in, in quiet places, uh, keeping the flame of this teaching alive sort of beneath the surface. It continues to influence the culture. And though it is not obvious when there's not one of these teachers in the world, until a new teacher appears. And then, once again, this teaching, this ancient teaching of, of man's inner development comes to the fore, it becomes apparent, but this time in a form or in a language that's suitable for people of the current time, the current generation, in a different language than it was before. Mm -hmm. So this brotherhood that Gurdjieff studied with over, over 100 years ago now, uh, he found the answer to his question, it was just this sort of a school. The names of Gurdjieff's teachers are unknown to us. They're record them, he didn't tell anybody, uh, but he took what he learned and he put it in a form that is available and useful to people in the West now. Right. <clears throat> and as a result of intensive study with his teaching, as, as you had said, Gurdjieff found the answer to his question, and that was that man was put on earth, half developed by higher power, and left to develop himself through his own, um, his own will and his own effort, and that is what esoteric schools are for to help man achieve his aim. So over the course of our shows, we will study man, and parallel with that, we will study the world in which man lives in order to understand why we are the way we are and why we cannot be any different without help from these higher, higher, this higher, higher knowledge or from esoteric schools. And, and to make something clear, they're called esoteric schools, and esoteric, of course, meaning hidden. But there's actually nothing hidden in them, except in the same way that knowledge in a book is hidden if you never read the book. So if you, if you own a book, you may have it sitting on your shelf, it may be quite a pretty book, and yet if you do not read it and make the effort to understand what this book says, then it, that is hidden knowledge. So it's exactly the same way with these so-called esoteric schools. The knowledge is available if people are willing to make the effort to learn it. And so, simply reading about the knowledge is a first step, but it does not unlock the understanding. And that's something that's quite important to realize, that it takes a school to help a person to work on both knowledge and being, which are two quite different things, and in that way, create understanding. Right, and a school in the sense that we are discussing is an organization for the transmission to a certain number of prepared people, knowledge that comes from higher mind. 
I'm going to read something um, quite short from, from one of the books that I brought in. This is The Fourth Way. It's by P.D. Ospensky. But he explains our te the ideas a little bit. So, At this point, the question naturally arises, why is it so difficult for a man to start changing himself to come to a possibility of growing? Because you see, we must remember that man, man is created in a very interesting way by nature. He is developed up to a certain point. After this point, he must develop himself. Nature does not develop man beyond a certain point. Later, we shall learn in full detail up to what point man is developed and how his further development must begin. And we shall see why, from this point of view, he could never develop himself and why he cannot be developed by nature. But before that, we must understand certain general conditions. It is difficult for a man even to start any kind of work on himself because he lives in a very bad place in the universe. At first, that must sound a very strange idea. We do not realize that there are better and worse places in the universe, and we certainly do not realize that we happen to be in almost the worst place. We fail to realize it because from one point of view, our knowledge of the universe is too complicated. From another point of view, it does not take into account real facts. If we look for the nearest place to us in the universe, we realize that we live on the Earth and that the Moon is under the influence of the Earth. At the same time, we see that the Earth is one of the planets of the solar system, that there are bigger planets, probably more powerful than the Earth, and that all these planets taken together must somehow affect and control the Earth. Next, in the scale comes the Sun, and we realize that the Sun controls all the planets and the Earth at the same time. If you think from this point of view, you will already have a different idea of the solar system, although there is nothing new in these ideas. It is only a question of how to relate one thing to another. And this is where esoteric schools come in. Schools are not necessary for the vast majority of people. They are necessary, however, for those who have realized the inadequacy of their knowledge that's been obtained in ordinary ways, and that by, them, by themselves, with their own strength, or own efforts, they can, nearly, they, can, they can neither resolve the problems which surround them nor find the right way. Now, schools can be of different type corresponding to different ways. So traditionally in life, and particularly in, in the East, there have been three traditional ways for a person to achieve self-development, self-consciousness, what might be called enlightenment. Mm -hmm. So we'll call it enlightenment. And these are the way of the physical man, or what might be called the fakir, the way of the emotional man, or what might be called the monk, and the way of the intellectual man, which we can call the yogi. And the physical man, the fakir, he pushes the physical body to its limits over and over and over again. The fakir overcomes the physical needs and the desires of his body, and through extreme physical stress, strength and endurance, through pain and endurance, he overcomes his physical body. Mm -hmm. So traditionally, we've all seen pictures of, of the Indian fakirs lying on the bed of nails, uh, walking on hot coals, holding their arms out in the same position for many years. Uh, they may sit in an anthill or look at the sun until they go blind. Things like this that are at odds with the natural tendency of our bodies, but through these efforts and through these prolonged uh, overcomings of their physical body, they can attain self-development, self-consciousness, or enlightenment. And it is a long and difficult and uncertain way. Right, right. Well, the second way is the way of the monk, and it's often called the way of the emotional man. In it, a person may attain self-consciousness or enlightenment through purity of heart, faith and prayer. And this way is shorter and more sure and more definite than the way of the fakir. It requires certain conditions, however. Um, first of all, it usually requires a withdrawal from life. And above all, it requires unquestionable faith. For if there is no faith, a man cannot be a true monk. And the third way is often called the intellectual way or the way of the yogi. A yogi may attain self-consciousness, enlightenment through abstract thinking, uh, contemplation through meditation. It's some kind, sometimes called the way of knowledge and 
way of consciousness. And there are many different kinds of yoga, and one of them is a yoga of knowledge, which might be seen as the study of a new way of thinking. And it teaches us to think in different categories, so not just our ordinary categories, but beyond the categories of space and time and causality. And then again, there's another type of yoga, which is work on developing consciousness. Right, and when we speak about these three ways, we speak about principles. In actual life, these three ways are seldom met with in pure form, and they are, they're typically mixed. Um, but if you know the principle, then when you study school practices, you can separate which practice belongs to which way. Although in many respects, these ways are very efficient, the characteristic thing about them is that the first step is the most difficult. From the, from the first moment, you have to give up everything and do what you were told. And if you, if you keep one little thing, then you cannot follow any of those ways. So all they, although the three ways are good in many aspects and in many other respects, they are not sufficiently elastic, um, at least for those of us living in the Western world. They do not suit our present mode of life. When followed in their pure form, they often require you to, to go away and withdraw from life. And that does, not, that does not suit our way of life here in the Western world. Further, they focus and develop only on one part of a person. So the fakir, as you had mentioned, just focuses on the um, instinctive and moving functions or centers. And the emotional man simply focuses on the emotions. And the yogi, um, in the pure form, focuses solely on the intellect. And so that leaves part of a person undeveloped and um, not able to, to, to attain everything balanced in a balanced way. The system of inner development that wisdom through action teaches is often referred to as the fourth way. And it's a special way. It's not a combination of the other three. It, it is different from the others. First of all, that there is no external giving up of things because all of the work is inner. It's inside a person. So a person has to begin work in the exact conditions that they find themselves in when they meet it because these conditions are perfect. They're exactly the right conditions for a person. Mm -hmm. It's the conditions that is, are natural to them. If they begin to work and study in these conditions, then maybe a man can attain something. And then later, if necessary, that person will be able to change their conditions, but not before seeing the necessity for it. Right. So, first of all, we need to know what we can gain, what we can become. <clears throat> Unless we have a little understanding of what is possible for us, we may set our sights actually too low or on imaginary things. And occasionally people, people will have flashes of um, heightened awareness or even higher states of consciousness. Sometimes this comes about in moments of deja vu or um, moments of extreme emotional stress or physical danger. And so you, a person, maybe you have verified that something else exists. However, we do not know ourselves. We, we do not know our true nature. We do not know our potentialities. Um, and that leaves us in, in a quite precarious situation. So now um, Ospensky gives a real good analogy about man's situation and, and what it means to not, not know yourself. So it is very important to understand what is a complete being and what is an incomplete being? Because if this is not understood from the beginning, it will be difficult to go further. Perhaps, as an exam an, perhaps an example will help to illustrate what I mean. Let us compare a horse carriage with an airplane. An airplane has many possibilities that an ordinary carriage does not have. But at the same time, an airplane can be used as an ordinary carriage. It would be very clumsy and inconvenient and quite expensive However, you can attach two horses to it and travel in an airplane by road. Suppose the man who has this airplane does not know that it has an engine and can move by itself, and suppose he learns about the engine. Then he can dispense with the horses and use it as a motor car, but it will still be too clumsy. Suppose that the man studies this machine and discovers that it can fly. Certainly. It will have many advantages which he missed when he used the airplane as a carriage. This is what we are doing with ourselves. We use ourselves as a carriage when we could fly. But examples are one thing and facts are another. 
There is no need of allegories and analogies, for we can speak about actual facts if we begin to study consciousness in the right way. If we, we return for a moment to the analogy of an airplane, what is the reason why our airplane cannot fly? Naturally, the first reason is because we do not know the machine, how to work it, and how to put it in motion. And the second reason is that as a result of this ignorance, the machine works at a very slow speed. The effect of this slow speed is much greater than if we compare a horse carriage and an airplane. We're constantly, constantly wasting our energy. And as a result, we're in quite a low state. Um, one of the main ways we waste our energy is we have many habits, habits of thinking, habits of feeling, habits of reacting that have been developed over our lifetimes. And because of this, we're obligated to think and feel and react to many things that are completely useless and even harmful. And we do not even realize that the vast majority of our interactivity, all the things going on inside us, our thoughts and our emotions, all of our interactivity is completely habitual. And this is why, although it's somewhat of a harsh term, uh, Mr. Spensky called us, and quite accurately, external stimulus response machines. So because we're unaware of our actions, both internal and external, the things that happen inside us and the things that happen to us, it leaves us open to have anything at all happen, both right. inside and outside. Right, but fortunately we do not have to continue to be machines reacting to circumstances. And this is part of the work of esoteric schools. We cannot learn much until we have some control over our mechanical nature. This means, first of all, that there must be something inside of us that is not a machine. And it may be quite small and weak, but it must be there. And with work, it can become stronger. So there are two sides to a person which are developed simultaneously when one begins working in a school. Knowledge and being are worked upon right up front. The ability to understand something actually depends on one's being, which will also increase with schoolwork. Now, you may not have a good understanding of what knowledge and being and understanding mean. However, not, not to worry, because we will be having a, a future show here on SBN that discusses knowledge and being and understanding. So when you are working on yourself, or you begin working on yourself, it is, as it is often referred to, there are two principles that act as safeguards. One of them is that you must not blindly believe anything. Each area of study that you are working on has to be verified by you. And secondly is that you do not do anything without understanding what you are doing. The result of every effort is actually measured by understanding. Work in this school is quite practical. Each thing you study and observe can be directly applied to your life regardless of the circumstances or situation that you happen to be in. There's a central theme in this teaching, and that theme is that man is asleep, that we live our lives mechanically. So in this state of sleep, everything happens. Good things happen to us, we find money in the street, we win the lottery, or bad things happen to us. And it's all a result of accident. It's forces that have no relation to us because we have no control. So this is not our natural state, though. We live in this state because of the conditions of life, the conditions of our upbringing. We simply do not know any better. Our birthright is to be conscious. It is the way that we're supposed to be as human beings. And occasionally, we recognize this for just a flash. We have a flash of these higher states, higher states of consciousness, and which they might be seen as a direct connection to the divine they're possible. So to awaken means to overcome the torpor and the stupor of life, to overcome the mechanical acquired personality, the parts of us that aren't truly us, and to develop our essence or our true personality, the part of us that is actually our own individual nature. So we can start to live our lives. We can connect to what's higher in us, which is connected to what's higher outside of us, to the, the divine. And this system is often known as esoteric Christianity. 
and it does teach a way to come into contact with a higher in us and outside of us. So that's the goal, but how did we come to this low state? Right. Well, we've acquired many bad habits, as you've alluded to, um, both of thinking and of feeling. And one of these habits is thinking without purpose. Our thinking has become habitual and automatic. Um, think about the last time there was some unpleasant event at work and you spent the rest of the day going over and over and over in your mind what you said, what you didn't say, what they said to you, how they shouldn't have said that. And, and this happens to each person. We play that little record player over and over again. If we're, if we're lucky, we play it all night and we are up in the morning and it's still, those tapes are still playing in our head. Um, or perhaps we are... Um, we're, we're reading things on the internet, we're reading things in magazines or in newspapers, and then somebody asks us a question that's a related topic, and we start talking about it based on what we read, and we call that thinking. And that's, the system teaches that that's, that's, not, that's not real thinking. It's, it's quite, um, quite ordinary. In fact, there are two different ways to look at thinking. One of them is looking at, um, there's two different kinds of thinking, theoretical, logical, or, or what we might call ordinary thinking. And this is, this is that thinking that sees things in black and white, good or bad, yes or no. Um, it reads something and therefore believes it knows, um, has lots of opinions. It's, it's real limited. There are certain uses for it, but not, not for what we're talking about. What this, the system of inner development and self-development that we're talking about requires what's called psychological thinking. And psychological thinking is much different than theoretical or ordinary thinking because it, it sees the possibility that things have an inner meaning. It, seeing, it sees that, that everything is actually connected. And we do have examples in, in our lives of this, of this psychological thinking. Some that, that come to my mind are, um, if you've ever tried to read um, older versions of the Bible, either the Old Testament or the New Testament, um, Hermes, Trismegistus, his writings have been extremely accurate, but they're, they're written in a different, a different form. Um, some Eastern philosophies um, have also had this, Plato, Pythagoras, there's many examples out there of that psychological thinking if you go looking for it. And it's obviously not the same mindset that we see every day. So to come to this level of thinking, this higher thinking, we have to become more conscious and attaining consciousness it's connected with the gradual liberation from mechanicalness because as we are we're fully we're completely mechanical um, and at the same time we cannot become conscious all at once it takes a period of time so there's this period of work on oneself in which a man attains more consciousness and the more a man attains consciousness the more he leaves mechanicalness which means he becomes more free from these accidental mechanical laws. So what are some of the laws that we are stuck under? Well, there are laws that are perfectly ordinary and normal, and these would be the physical and biological laws. We're under many different types of laws. Physical laws, like every creature on Earth, we have to live in certain conditions, certain temperatures, certain air that we can breathe, certain right. food we can eat. Uh, these are all laws for us, and this is not what we're talking about changing. There are psychological laws, though, that we can become free of. Uh, for instance, ignorance. Our ignorance is actually a law for us. It is something that we have no say over. If when we are ignorant, and it's a law. But if we begin to know ourselves, then we begin to get rid of this law of ignorance. We begin to become free of it. Right. Um, the, so the fact that we are living a mechanical life, as you said, puts us under many unnecessary laws. And it makes things much more complicated for us. For example, we know that all men live under the law of identification. That's another law. Those who begin to remember themselves get rid of the law of identification. Other, some of the other laws of mechanicalness include the law of accident, the law of negative emotions, imagination, and many, many, many more. We'll probably 
end up doing a show on some of the other mechanicalities because they're, they're everywhere. They're quite in abundance. Yes. I, I like to think of it this way, so I'm going to read from Ospensky's The Fourth Way. So try to find an analogy to what it means to be under more laws and fewer laws. So suppose a man lives an ordinary life, and then there is conscription, the draft, and he enters military service. While he's in the army, he is under more laws. When his period of military service is over, he is under fewer laws. So then suppose that while he is in the army, he commits a crime and is sent to prison. So then he is under prison laws in addition to military laws, the laws of his country, physical and biological laws, and so on. And this is the kind of analogy we must find to understand the idea. For instance, if a man is well, he is under a certain number of laws. But if he is ill, he is under more laws because he has to obey his doctor or go to the hospital and then be under the laws of the hospital. Right, right. So escape from these laws does not happen overnight. We've gone years and years solidifying our mechanicalness. Everyone has different limitations and weaknesses. And without schools, one cannot know from which laws one can be out from under or find the means of being free from them. So let's look a little more deeply at this idea of living a life of illusion and mechanicalness. So the first step in acquiring consciousness is the realization that we are not conscious. And ironically, this illusion cannot be changed alone, for there are many others. So one of the worst illusions is the illusion that we can do. And all of our life is based on this illusion. We always think that we are doing something when in reality we're not doing anything. Everything happens to us. We find money in the street. We, these, these things happen. So another illusion is that we're awake. And when we realize that we're actually asleep, we can see that all history is made by people who are asleep. Sleeping people fight. They cause wars. They end wars. They make laws and sleeping people obey them. Sleeping people disobey them. It's all history. is the history of sleeping people. And one of the strange characteristics of this sleep is that we are stuck in our logical minds. So that you were, what you were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. the, the mind that's good for thinking about tables and chairs, we're stuck there when we're in this low state of consciousness and we're governed by these wrong ideas. If we could change our attitude towards these wrong ideas and understand what they are, this in itself would be a great change and it would immediately change other things. Right. And in order to escape from this situation, we begin with self-observation. Sincere, non-judgmental self-observation allows us to shed a light on what is happening in our inner world on a regular basis. We look at our thoughts, feelings, actions, interactions um, to begin with. And the chief obstacle to the attainment of self-consciousness is that we think we already have it. And ironically, it's just this belief that keeps us from working towards obtaining it. So once a person has begun to realize that they are missing something in their life, um, call it a lack of meaning, a lack of consciousness, maybe they have a feeling that there's something missing, or that surely going to work, get, being up in the morning, going to your nine to five job, coming back at night, you know, eating dinner, watching TV, and repeating it over and over again, there has to be something more. And we're here to talk about the fact that there is something more. And it could be that you've had experiences of higher states, or you've, or at least higher states of awareness, um, moments of deja vu, when you're aware of yourself and your surroundings simultaneously, or maybe moments of extreme emotional stress or physical danger, such as um, when you're in a car automobile accident or you're watching something so bizarre happen, it's as though you're watching from the, from the part of an impartial observer. Well, Mr. Ospensky, in, in one of his other books, he wrote, he wrote many, and we'll be referring, them, referring to many of the books throughout our shows, but In, in Search of the Miraculous is a, is a book that he wrote about his search for the miraculous when he met up with Gurdjieff and the teaching and all the things that came about as a result of it. And there's a part in here where he, um, Aspensky was Russian, and so he writes a lot about things that occurred in Russia. 
And this particular episode that, he, that I'm going to share with you takes place in St. Petersburg. And so there are some, there are some Russian words that will be read in it. But he talks, it's, a, it's an excellent example of showing um, self-observation, attempting to self-remember what happens when we're in and out of higher states. So um, this is, see what you think. Sometimes self-remembering was not successful. At other times, it was accompanied by curious observations. I was once walking along the litany towards the Nevsky, and in spite of all my efforts, I was unable to keep my attention on self-remembering. The noise, movement, everything distracted me. Every minute, I lost the thread of attention, found it again, and then lost it again. At last, I felt a kind of ridiculous irritation with myself and I turned into the street on the left, having firmly decided to keep my attention on the fact that I would remember myself, at least for some time, at any rate, until I reached the following street. I reached the Nadenjaskaya without losing the thread of attention, except perhaps for short moments. Then I again turned toward the Nevsky, realizing that in quiet streets, it was easier for me not to lose the line of thought and wishing, therefore, to test myself in more noisy streets. I reached the Nevsky, still remembering myself, and already beginning to experience the strange emotional state of inner peace and confidence which comes after great efforts of this kind. Just round the corner on the Nevsky was a tobacconist shop where they made my cigarettes. Still remembering myself, I thought I would call there and order some cigarettes. Two hours later, I woke up in the Trevenchkaskaya, that is, far away. I was going by cab to the printers. The sensation of awakening was extraordinarily vivid. I can almost say that I came to. I remembered everything at once, how I had been walking along the Nadevchkaskaya, how I had been remembering myself, how I had thought about cigarettes, and how at this thought I seemed all at once to fall and disappear into a deep sleep. At the same time, while immersed in this sleep, I had continued to perform consistent and expedient actions. I left the tobacconist, called at my flat in the litany, telephoned to the printers. I wrote two letters. Then again, I went out of the house. I walked on the left side of the Nevsky up to the Gostinoi de Boer, intending to go to the office to Skaya. Then I had changed my mind as it was getting late. I had taken a cab and was driving to the Kabarlergardskaya to my printers. <clears throat> and on the way, while driving along the Tabarlergardskaya, I began to feel a strange uneasiness, as though I had forgotten something. And suddenly I remembered that I had forgotten to remember myself. An excellent example of sleep and, and coming out of it. So there are many, many other things that we think we have. And because we think we have them, we cannot actually have them. So for instance, individuality, oneness. We think we're one. Uh, we think we're <clears throat> indivisible. And again, we think we have will, or we think that if we wanted to, we could have will, that we just didn't have to have it at the moment. But many of these illusions spring from the fact that we have this one physical body generally one name throughout our lives and because it does not change we tend to attribute oneness and individuality to ourselves um, we think that every time we say I we're referring to the same person but in actuality there are quite a few different people in each one of us and each time we say I, it's a response to an external stimulus. It's, it, again, as Spensky said, we, we react to external stimulus, and this is a symptom or a cause or both of our sleep. Right. And there is, as you say, there is a definite obstacle and definite reason why we cannot attain consciousness as we are. And the chief obstacle is in the way of lying. This is from The Psychology of Man's Possible Evolution. It's a short book by Ospensky and, and quite, quite good. It goes over the ideas of the work um, quite specifically. So what is lying? As it is understood in ordinary language, lying means distorting or in some cases hiding the truth or what people believe to be the truth. This lying plays a very important part in life. 
But there are much worse forms of lying when people do not know that they lie. I said in the last lecture that we cannot know the truth in our present state and can only know the truth in the state of objective consciousness. How then can we lie? There seems to be a contradiction here, but in reality there is none. We cannot know the truth, but we can pretend that we know. And this is lying. Lying fills all our life. People pretend that they know all sorts of things about God, about the future life, about the universe, about the origin of man, about evolution, about everything. But in reality, they do not know anything, even about themselves. And every time they speak about something they do not know, as though they knew it, they lie. Consequently, the study of lying becomes of the first importance in the work. The work is particularly concerned with the lies a man says and thinks about himself. These lies make the study of man very difficult. Man as he is, is not a genuine article. He is an imitation of something, and a very bad imitation. So imagine a scientist on some remote planet who has received from Earth specimens of artificial flowers without knowing anything about real flowers. It will be extremely difficult for him to define them, to explain their shape, their color, the material from which they are made, that is wire, cotton, wool, and colored paper, as well as to classify them in any way. So psychology, or the work, stands in a very similar position in relation to man. It has to study an artificial man without knowing the real man. Obviously, it cannot be easy to study a being such as man who does not know himself what is real and what is imaginary in him. So psychology and the work must begin with a division between the real and the imaginary in man. For instance, we know nothing about ourselves and deep down we actually know that we really know nothing about ourselves. And yet, we never recognize or admit this fact. We never confess it even to ourselves. And we act and think and speak as though we know exactly who we were. And this is the origin, the beginning of lying. So, for instance, we lie when we tell other people what they, we think they want to hear. Mm -hmm. Even if we don't, especially if we don't believe it ourselves. Right. And we lie when we compliment somebody. Just a few examples we feel obliged to and not because we actually mean it. So the study of lying is, is a huge part of this work and, and there's some, some things that are easier to see in other people. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, I, I have a friend. She says she's never late. It's every time we meet, she's late. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it uh, she, she always has an excuse. And it's always a lie, and it's, it's just in her nature, in this mechanical nature that she always says she's never late, and she's always late. Mm -hmm. So you probably know people who claim that they always take other people's viewpoints into account, right. and then when you hear them argue with people, it's obvious that they actually don't, that they don't care anything for other people's viewpoints. All kinds of examples in the world, just turn on the television. It's easy, easy to see lying in the world. But most of all, we lie to ourselves. Um, one of my favorites, about once a week I decide I'm going to be up early and go work out at 6 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And so there's one eye that says, I need to work out, I'm going a little flabby here. And so I'm, I'm going I'm to get up at 6 o'clock and I set the alarm and that's one eye. And then at 6 o'clock there's a quite different eye that actually has to get out of bed and put on some clothes and go work out. And almost inevitably, this other eye has no interest in working out, hits this news button, goes back to sleep. Right. And this is our life. We, we live at the mercy of these little, little eyes. There was a part, there was yeah. a part in the fourth way. I think we ought to, think sure. we ought to read that. So Mr. Spensky had a great analogy allegory here. He says, there is a very good Eastern allegory which deals with creation of eye. In this case, he means real eye. Man is compared to a house full of servants without master or steward to look after them. So the servants do what they like. None of them does his own work, and the house is in a state of complete chaos because all the servants 
try to do someone else's work, which they are not competent to do. So the cook works in the stables, and the coachman in the kitchen, and so on. The only possibility for things to improve is if a certain number of servants decide to elect one of themselves to be the deputy steward. And in this way, to make him control the other servants. So he can only do one thing. He puts each servant where he belongs, and so they begin to do their right work. When this is done, then there is a possibility of the real steward coming to replace the deputy steward and to prepare the house for the master. We do not know what the real steward means or what the master means, but we can take it that the house full of servants and the possibility of a deputy steward describes our situation. This allegory helps us to understand the beginning of the possibility of creating a permanent I. So from the point of view of self-study and of work to, to attain one I, we must understand the process by which we may come from this plurality to oneness. It's a complicated process and it has different stages. So between the present state of plurality of eyes and the one controlling eye we wish to attain, there are certain stages of development which must be studied. But first, we must understand that there are certain formations in us, without knowing which we cannot understand how we eventually come from our present state to the state of one eye, if it is possible for us. Right, and I know that this can be a, an idea that can be difficult to swallow, that we are mechanical and made up of all these many eyes. However, it is, again, something that is, that is verified in the work. And each, each person has their own limitations and their own strengths, their own weaknesses, but they also have their own strengths. And um, with our show, we will increase knowledge. And um, however, in order to go beyond knowledge, you actually have to um, make a change in order to work on being and, and gain understanding. So this is something that I'm sure we'll do a show on in the near future, this mm -hmm. idea of knowledge, being, and understanding. But just to give a, a quick analogy, in my own case, when I was a young man in, in college, I was studying to be an architect, and I learned a lot about the theory of architecture. I read books on architecture, and I read uh, different architectural criticism magazines, and all kinds of things that gave knowledge about architecture. And eventually, I finished school and became an architect and got my first job. And my first day on the job, I realized that all this knowledge I had acquired in school about architecture wasn't actually the same as being an architect. And so there was a period of, of quite a few years of working on being, which means working on actually knowing internally how to be an architect, what it takes to create a building and to have it be built. And it's different from knowledge because it requires actually doing it. To, to have this being. And so after a number of years of, of actually working in the field, I had this being and I had the knowledge from before, and then I actually understood it. And this is exactly the same process that's required to do anything well, and it's the process that's required to know oneself and to, to study right, oneself. Right, right. And, and most people have, have, have experienced something where they've gained knowledge. and and being and understanding. It may be something as simple as learning how to make a good cup of coffee. You know, you know what types of coffee beans, how to grind them, and you, un and you practice, 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 and quite, then you quite gain, important. that's right, and then you gain being and understanding and making coffee. And, and what we're talking about through wis with wisdom through action is that knowledge and being on yourself and coming out of the mechanical parts of yourself and actually becoming self-aware, self self-conscious, and, and reaching your potential. Being, being more real, woman or, or, woman or man. Um, so before we end today's show, I wanted to read something from a, another book. Um, and we will be referring to, to many authors throughout our show because fortunately they wrote a lot about these ideas and brought the system to the Western world. Um, this one is by Maurice Nicole. He was a student of both Gurdjieff and Ospensky. He was um, a British psychologist. And he wrote many, many books. This happens to be a, a vol volume one of a five-volume five set entitled uh, The Psychological Commentaries on the Teaching 
of Gurdjieff and of Svensky. All esoteric teaching regards man as between two levels, sometimes called earth and heaven. All esoteric teaching also says that if man on earth is cut off from all influences coming from a higher level, mankind will perish. Just as physical nature, as we behold it in the external visible world, depends for its life on the influence of the sun, so man in his inner world depends on influences from a higher level. If these influences are received by no one on earth, man is cut off and perishes. One of the problems, therefore, of esotericism is how to keep alive this contact or connection. How to raise the level of being of a man apart from his level of knowledge. That is, to raise him on the side of good. For goodness is of being, and knowledge is of mind. Man can no longer see good directly or be taught directly from good. His mind must alter first, so he must be taught knowledge or truth about a higher level of being first. So the object of the knowledge is to raise the man's level of being. We are always looking for people that are interested in applying these ideas to their lives. So visit our website at wisdomthroughaction.org to find out more. And thank you for joining us on SBN. We will see you next week. Wisdom Through Action is a contemporary sea influence school teaching the work of personal inner development in the system brought to the Western world by G.I. Gurdjieff and P.D. Ospensky. Mr. Ospensky said, The most important ideas and principles of this system do not belong to me. This is chiefly what makes them valuable, because if they belonged to me, they would be like all other theories invented by ordinary minds. What he meant was that this system comes from higher mind, from conscious influence. It is an objective system to bring a man to awakening.